I think people sometimes forget that what enables AI to be successful, which is large amounts of data, is the same thing that also inhibits it in situations like a pandemic. During COVID, we saw that actually some data sets weren't representative of um, the BME community. How do we ensure that we collect those data sets? I just think AI alone making reliable decisions in health is a long way off. I think AI should just merely support clinicians, not serve to exactly replace it. I mean, as a clinician, I would always say I, I highly, highly, highly doubt that they would ever lead to unemployment. At the end of the day, the reality is, is we don't actually have enough healthcare professionals. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Teens in the Eye podcast. Today, I'll be talking about AI in the battle against COVID and the future of AI in healthcare. My amazing guest is Dr. Indra Joshi, Director of AI for NHSX. And I'm your co-host, Anisha Rahman, a big AI ethics and tech enthusiast who is outgoing and bubbly and somewhat critical. I am currently developing an AI assistant to help young people manage their emotional well-being needs and I'm found intensely project managing. We started by asking Indra exactly how AI has been used in the fight against COVID. So I think when COVID, when the pandemic hit globally, um, a lot of people, a lot of people were thinking, um, what what can we what can we do with the technology? What can we do with digital health to really transform some of what we're doing? And I don't think it's so much the focus about AI could do during COVID from a health perspective, but what that digital transformation could do. And what we saw, especially with, um, you know, we had to keep remote, obviously, during that time, that remote consultation, the idea of remote monitoring, what we call devices, so things like blood pressure cuffs or um, uh, blood test kits, you know, those kind of remote products, which have a digital element to them. So they might be associated with an app or a learning model behind them. We saw a lot of drive through that. And so I think from a digital transformation, COVID has been in a slightly obscure way, very helpful because it's allowed us to drive through a lot of those things. And AI in its in its pure sense has been really helpful. So obviously AI is great when you have loads and loads of data. Um, during the pandemic, uh, so for example, we saw lots of people want to build what we call models and algorithms. And how do you uh, get some insights from all those different big data sets? So in health, um, a nice example of what we did was we built what we call a COVID-19 data store. So it brought in lots of operational data. And what I mean by operational data is things like beds, um, oxygen, um, where available um, kit is across. So kit being like ventilators and actually being able to look at that from a huge picture um, is something that we were then able to build models and algorithms on the back of. And now we're seeing that actually that's really helpful in helping us plan for whatever the future might bring from a, a COVID wave. There's been a lot of debate recently about whether AI being used effectively in the fight against COVID. On the one hand, we're very used to a steady stream of success stories about AI and AI technologies in the news. But on the other hand, it's really important to be aware of the limitations of AI in such a short period of time where we may not have access to enough data to really use artificial intelligence and machine learning effectively. We asked Indra whether she thought AI had been used effectively in the fight against COVID. I think sometimes there is a misconception that... um, when you look at kind of the AI life cycle, a lot of it is around engineering bringing the data together, improving the data quality, and then the actual AI element. Oh my goodness, I'm on a podcast, so I was going to say in inverted commas, but in inverted commas, the AI element, all the kind of machine learning data science bit, is almost at the very end of that journey. And people underestimate the amount of effort that goes into improving data quality, standardising data sets, so that actually when you do the machine learning and the data science, you've got something good to work against. And I think that's where a lot of people sometimes um, misunderstood, but didn't really appreciate the amount of effort. And when you've got a short space of time, which um, the pandemic kind of pressurised a lot of results to come out quickly, I think people underestimated the amount of time that goes into what we call the groundwork of that. So 
from a health perspective, we've known this for a long time. We do quite a lot of work to try and improve our what we call data proportionality, so the quality of your data sets. But I think when you look at it from a wider market range, yes, you know, there could have been areas where it was difficult to, to do that groundwork in the space of time we had. Yeah, that's super interesting. Moving on to more general questions about AI and healthcare. How can we ensure the fair implementation of AI into healthcare globally without irreversibly widening the gap between developed and poorer countries? It's a really good question. When you talk about, um, it goes back down to, (laughs) it always goes back down to the data with AI. So there are two things that you really have to make sure, and we're trying really hard here in, um, so I run something called an NHS AI lab. Um, And one of the key things we're very keen to do is make sure that our quality of data, but also the representation of data is equal. So, um, so, for example, during COVID, we saw that actually some data sets weren't representative of um, the BME community. How do we ensure that we collect those data sets, but also the hard to reach communities who might not always put their data in digitally? So how do we ensure that we collect all of those data? And so I think from that perspective, we've got to be very mindful when you're building and training um, AI models in in healthcare. And then from the flip side is the deployment. So when you're actually putting a product into use in a system, is that you're also thinking about, well, what are those hard to reach communities? And we've had a couple of really good examples that um, we've seen that actually by doing things digitally, you may actually be able to reach hard hard to reach communities in a different way than you would by actually bringing them physically into a hospital or into a into a primary care practice uh, like your GP. So I think there's a, a, a double-edged sword here that we need to be mindful of and it's not necessarily just about AI, it's about digital transformation as a whole. But the great thing, and we've seen this with a few companies and people might be aware, but the great thing about AI is it can reach a huge number of a population who may not be able to have um, healthcare at their door. So we've th- seen things with what we call the triage, you know, when you want to go and see your doctor, but you fill out some forms online. A lot of people around the world have access more to a mobile phone than they do to a, a physical doctor. And the same is what we call um, image recognition. So looking at either a scan or or a picture of your eye at the back of your eye and actually being able to look at a huge number of those pictures quite quickly is something where AI can really help. And we've seen some really good case examples in in some um, less developed countries. We then asked Indra a more philosophical and ethical question. If AI and a human, a healthcare professional, disagree about a diagnosis or something in healthcare practice, who do we trust? Yeah, I I always love this question. Um, The reality is, is we're still a few years away from that. Um, so when we actually look at the technology, um, let's take image recognition as a good example. If an image, if if a machine learning algorithm reads an image, let's call it an X-ray for easy for easy sake, and says this X-ray is normal or not normal, usually in some way along the pathway, a human is in the loop. So we call it a human in the loop, um, and they may disagree with it, and that's completely fine. But they've they've counteracted that disagreement and said, actually, I think this is what it is. We will always have, you know, I think for the for the foreseeable few years, we will still have a human in the loop um, from a clinical perspective. I think the disagreement, and we've seen it uh, in other industries as well, is when we do it from an operational perspective. So if a model says, actually, I don't know, this cohort of people need to to have an appointment now or you need to put this cohort of people out of a ward and into another ward well you could disagree with that couldn't you say actually I don't feel that I'm ready or you might say actually the the patient's not not ready for that but but who do you argue with and so we put quite often what we call something a standard operating procedure it's a little bit boring and and um, technical but really important in normal operational processes just to say if there is a disagreement, there's what we call a safety net to gather in um, any disagreement and make sure that nobody gets harmed or hurt. So those are the most kind of important things. At the end of the day, nobody wants to cause harm or hurt. Um, And in healthcare, we take that really seriously. I completely agree. 
I just think AI alone making reliable decisions in health is a long way off. I think AI should just merely support clinicians, not serve to exactly replace it. Because, you know, yes, AI is very good at making diagnoses of physical conditions from results, for example, you know, scanning. But AI is not ready to fully interpret a patient's nuanced response to a question, nor is it ready to actually replace examining patients. I think that this holistic side of a patient consultation will be very difficult to replicate with digital tools because maybe doctors are much more better equipped to understand those non-verbal signs or the tone of the voice and other subtle cues. I just feel like loss of that human contact could actually lead to a lot more negative consequences as well because it might be a reduced awareness of patients' loneliness, their mental health, or maybe safeguarding and social needs. We just want to make sure that AI is used for good, not to entrench those existing health inequalities. We then asked Angel one of the most commonly asked questions about AI in healthcare. Will the rapid implementation of AI into the healthcare sector result in unemployment? I mean, as a clinician, I would always say I, I highly, highly, highly doubt that they would ever lead to unemployment. At the end of the day, the reality is, is we don't actually have enough healthcare professionals for what, what care we need to give to patients and the community as a whole. So I think, practically speaking, the stats outweigh uh, the hype, so to say. I think what you will see is um, shortening of quite mundane tasks. You know, we do a lot of time. I'm not a radiologist, but I have colleagues who spend time, you know, you look at a tumour size or or a, um, I'd call it a blob on a, on a CT and you measure it. And, you know, that takes up time. It may take up a few seconds and you may get better at it over over your career. But that kind of what we call mundane tasks will become more automated and, and AI and machine learning can help in that. And so I think those bits will, we always say free up time, but allow um, clinicians time to do different things. So versus the kind of traditional care model we see today in 2020, we will see different different ways of giving care. And already we've seen it during the pandemic where people have got to get used to the remote monitoring, you know, understanding um, how you're feeling without being able to see you, for example. Um, so I think, you know, there will be a shift in how we work. But uh, yes, I've always been strongly against the unemployment route. <laughs> we then asked a more general question about bias and the ethics of bias in AI. During the pandemic, it was revealed that people from a certain ethnic background were much more likely by a significant proportion to die or be hospitalised because of COVID. This data is incredibly scary. We also know that AI and algorithms tend to pick up on these inherent biases within data sets and manifest and perpetrate them. Examples of these manifested biases can be seen with the debates around the use of facial recognition in the US. It kind of reminds me of this algorithm that many US health providers used to predict which patients would actually need more extra medical care. And unfortunately, what happened with that algorithm is that it privileged white patients over patients of colour, so blacks and Asians. So effectively, it actually bumped white patients up the queue for special treatments for complex conditions like kidney problems or diabetes. I think right now the issue with using AI in healthcare is that the governments just don't understand the risks that are inherent in using historical data to train machine learning algorithms to make predictions because what it does is just makes implementation a much more arduous process that is just rife with backlash. That data isn't completely diverse. We need to think about how are we actually going to make sure that we are properly representing other people of colour. Therefore, we asked Indra, in what ways can bias creep into the implementation of AI in the healthcare industry and how can we prevent it? Yeah, and I think when we talk about bias and and ethics as well, it's really important to make sure you get the fundamentals right. And so um, a couple of years ago, we here in the UK, we published something called a code of conduct for data driven healthcare. Um, we we're updating that to be a kind of a guide to good practice. So people know what the rules of the game are. And when you're coming in, it's not necessarily about um, just about the data, but making sure that 
you're collecting the data for the right reason. So if you're doing a research project, you've got what we call ethical approval to do that. You've got the right regulatory tick boxes in hand. And if you're producing a device, a medical device, that again, you know the different routes to get that. And what we're doing now is we've seen more and more um, that we need to work with partners across the system to make sure that together we highlight these issues, but we also standardise them. So when we talk about, I talked earlier about um, uh, during COVID that we weren't collecting the right types of data from different communities, but making sure that we highlight that and and build those into, we call them standards and policies. But what we mean by those is basically rules of the game. So when you're building something, you've got to be quite mindful of what that thing is. But say you're building a product that is for children, that you really collect data from a vast range of children, not just a certain range. And the great, the, the important thing with AI is that you also, you also do what we call a, a normal test. So it's great to collect it on the ones that are slightly different, but you also got to collect it on the normal ones. So they know when, when training, what normality is versus not normal. Um, and I would say we're very fortunate in health, actually. We've, we've already got some quite good, robust systems to make sure that we do get ethical approval. We do consider data proportionality. What I mean by data proportionality is you've got a wide range of data of equal um, uh, weighting according to what you're trying to solve. But fundamentally, and I always say this, and it's a big belief of mine, build something that answers a problem. Don't just get data because you happen to sit on a whole load of data and then build something. There's got to be a problem and then people will much more likely buy into what you're getting. We finished the episode by talking about the role of accountability and empathy in the healthcare industry. As we begin to implement AI into healthcare, how do we track and manage accountability? Who do we blame and what systems do we fix when things go wrong? And how important is it that an AI and the person making decisions is able to reflect and empathise? Yeah, I mean, you could take that question as a very kind of hypothetical academic question for sure but if we bring it down to a very practical level for me it's always about taking a tangible example um, and we'll go back to you know a nice tangible example we've got a, a company that looks at um, heart scans to say is that heart scan like likely to have what we call I'm trying to use a non-medical term here but a heart risk so a risk of disease in the future or imminently uh, based on the history as well. And so that decision is, they go through a huge process of gathering evidence, what we do doing a trial, and a trial is basically doing a very, very big controlled experiment to say, is the product coming out going to be doing what it says it does? And then you have a large team of experts that oversee that. And so from a very practical perspective, we don't expect the machine to come up with a novel idea and and kind of decide something completely new. We expect it to decide things based on the rules and the processes that even humans go through because it is at the end of the day trained on what humans have given it to train. So I, I think so long as we've got the rules and the processes in place, uh, the products that are built and implemented and the devices that come out should be safe. And then what we have to do in the background, I talked about this earlier, is that safety net. So once something is in the real setting, so it's in clinical practice or it's in an operational practice, is make sure that we have a safety net. So when something goes not quite according to plan, let's put it that way, versus wrong, um, is that you capture it. And things do go wrong. Things go wrong even now, you know, in clinical practice, in the hospital, things do go wrong. And that's okay. You shouldn't, we shouldn't be ashamed of that. We should just say, well, how do we capture it, learn from it, make sure it doesn't happen again. And we have to do exactly the same with a device or, or a piece of software. It's just, how do we capture it? Thank you for listening to this week's episode on AI in healthcare and AI against COVID. Tune in next week as we celebrate the Ada Lovelace Hackathon with a series of surprise special guests.